Welcome. I'm John Haskell from the Library of Congress. Today we have a book conversation on Sailing to Freedom, Maritime Dimensions of the Underground Railroad, which discusses a topic that has not received its due in the study of the African-American experience. We are joined by the editor of the book, Timothy Walker, professor of history at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, and two of the contributors, Cassandra Newby Alexander, professor of history and director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for the study of the African diaspora at Norfolk State University, and Cheryl Jennifer LaRoche, associate professor of historical preservation at the University of Maryland. And Tim, as the editor, I'm gonna hit you with the first question. How did your academic training and personal experiences lead you to this particular topic? Well, first of all, we're very grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I began life as a historian, as an early modern Europeanist. And uh, one of the key um, dimensions of that that I started to focus in on was maritime connections and maritime technology that allowed for the development of overseas uh, maritime-based empires. And I moved to New Bedford uh, to take up my job at UMass Dartmouth in 2004. And I, I was confronted with the historical context of New Bedford, which is fascinating about whaling and uh, abolitionism and New Bedford's role as a destination on the Underground Railroad, a place where people who were seeking freedom could come and find uh, a, uh, a welcoming environment and find work. And in the process of that, I learned a lot about uh, people who had escaped to New Bedford by water. Uh, and so my academic training directed me from a maritime um, orientation as well as a lot of experience teaching on large traditionally rigged sailing vessels, some of the big schooners and brigs and even full rig ships that work as sailing school vessels along the East Coast. I had worked aboard those and I was fascinated with this whole maritime uh, component. And so um, we started to gather together uh, people who had something to say about that. Uh, and I worked with a um, organization here in New Bedford called the New Bedford uh, Historical Society and its director, Lee Blake, we put together a uh, program called um, Sailing to Freedom, New Bedford and the Underground Railroad, which was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And that allowed us to bring together scholars who had unique insights on this uh, subject. So that's really kind of how the, the book came about and how my own training led into it. Um, it's a bit of a diversion from my normal research, but I'm... Um, uh, I'm very happy to have been able to coordinate this volume. So one of the things, Tim, I, I wanted to pin down some basics for the audience. Uh, sure. How do you define maritime escapes? Is there a set definition for exactly yeah. what that means? So merit, the definition of maritime implies salt water, and it implies um, uh, sort of uh, ships that are, that are sailing um, in blue water or coastal uh, capacities, trading up and down uh, the coast of, in this case, the United States, the Eastern Seaboard. But maritime escapes are escapes that are affected by uh, people who, uh, who seek the means of their conveyance to freedom by water, uh, typically using large uh, trading vessels that uh, moved up and down the East Coast. But it could also mean using smaller types of vessels to reach larger ones or even small vessels to sail northward, say from uh, the Chesapeake or uh, uh, in the northern um, uh, slave states to reach a free state by water. So Cassandra, walk us through a little bit how this would happen. Uh, how would a maritime escape happen for a slave? Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics. Um, I, I'll give you a couple of examples of what I've uncovered. Um, here in the Norfolk area, um, we would have we had a, a huge uh, number of ships coming and going from steamships to schooners and so forth. And there was a main place that they would dock. And these were the schooners who were carrying supplies, goods back and forth between different port areas. 
Um, and then there were, was a passenger area further down on the Norfolk waterfront. Um, and the area where the schooners were, it was very dirty, very rustic. Um, it was a working area. And people um, were able to get aboard these ships um, by various means. Sometimes they would dress in different kinds of clothing. We would have, for example, a number of women, because it was not typical for a woman to be on the docks, who would dress like a man. Um, and it was usually in the middle of the night or in the wee hours of the morning uh, where they would uh, get aboard these ships. For some of the schooners, uh, some of these captains actually built secret compartments aboard their schooners so that more than one or two people could escape. In, in the case of Norfolk, we would have Captain Alfred Fountain, who had a, a huge secret compartment built in which uh, as many as 22 to 25 people could cram into that section. For the passenger ships, it was usually someone like a, a steward uh, or one of the other crewmen who would assist people um, in, in securing what they call a compartment, which was usually a small little area above the boiler room or next to the boiler room and they would stay there for the duration of their journey which could last in some cases up to three days so you can imagine how horrific that particular journey was uh, we would have some people like the most famous of course was henry brown they called him henry box brown because he had himself nailed into a box um who would uh have someone secure them inside the box and they would be delivered usually to Philadelphia. That was the shortest uh, space between the Hampton Roads area of Virginia and a northern port. But then, of course, you would always have all of these slave catchers uh, hanging around these northern ports in the hopes of finding individuals who were hiding aboard these vessels. But another way um, that people escaped, as, as Timothy said, was um, uh, going across the rivers, like the Ohio River. Um, and they would um, simply get in some sort of flatboat. You had uh, Parker, who was actually uh, a formerly enslaved man from Virginia, who uh, was located in Ripley, Ohio. And he actually would take his flatboat and go in the middle of the night and go across the river and secure people and bring them to freedom and then uh, ferry them through, you know, send them up through different safe houses once they were in the Northern areas. And of course they were always, always, especially after 1850, uh, always uh, in danger of being uh, captured and returned to the South and people who helped them escape were also in danger of being imprisoned. And there are a number of records that show that some people were indeed caught and uh, put into the penitentiary. So, so Cassandra, how, how do we know? I mean, obviously there was a need for secrecy. How do we know that large numbers of people, I mean, what's the record that, that you as historians use to substantiate that large number of people successfully uh, went to freedom in this way? Um, well, you know, I, I call William Still's book, The Underground Railroad, the <laughs> of the Underground Railroad, um, because he points us in a lot of important directions. Um, but when you you use that and you start tracing people, then you find other records that support either what he's saying or adds to that record. And, and so I, I always start with William Still, um, but then you look at some of the census records, such as in New Bedford, and you see large numbers of people in the census records who were either from Virginia or from Maryland or from other Southern area, usually it was one of those two um, states, um, or their parents were from that area. And then you look them up in the census records a decade before or two decades before, and you don't see them in the records. Now, that's not a hardcore indication that they were um, had been formerly enslaved, but it is a pretty good indication. You also look at the muster records of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, and you see the large numbers of people who said that they were essentially freedom seekers uh, from Southern states who were living 
in uh, New Bedford or living in Boston for that matter. And then you find some of the records in um, black newspapers in the years following the Civil War up through the early 20th century. And, and they will document some of the activities or some of the experiences that they had. And so you, you then start piecing things together at that point. You look at the, the um, uh, imprisonment records and you find some documents there about people escaping. Uh, you look at some of the court records and you find indications of that. And then you have newspapers, of course, and those newspaper accounts will tell you um, that there were activities. So in the Hampton Roads area or in Virginia in general, a lot of the newspapers would report that there were a lot of incidences of people escaping and they were trying to find them. Or it was the aftermath where they were complaining that so many thousands of dollars was lost because of all of these successful escapes. Cheryl, in your research, tell us a little bit about the journey, because you took it from a, a, a somewhat different geographical perspective. Yes, I took a very different perspective. I used the landscape and geography. Um, my work on the Underground Railroad was largely in the West to begin with, and I always found myself standing on the river's edge, whether it was in Mississippi or the Ohio, and smaller bodies of water, you know, streams, creeks. But I knew that if I looked at the geography, and began to map and look at the black communities and look at the black churches, I knew that they were going to start their journey at the water's edge. And so as I developed what I call a geography of resistance, one of the six components of that geography is that the, the, the community or the church is going to be either sitting at the water's edge or near water. And when I really began to understand that, um, it was a matter of then starting to triangulate. I'd look at a place, I'd see if there was underground railroad activity, I would see if there were escapes, I would see if there were ads, and I brought it together. When, when Tim approached me to do this work, I didn't know a lot, I mean, I knew individual discrete stories about the Chesapeake, and I think that the work that, um, that I've done for the book on the Chesapeake is just the beginning. I believe that in the end, the whole Chesapeake will be dotted with sites and spaces that are uh, implicated for this maritime escape. Um, when I was in the West, I was at the Great Lakes. I was up in Canada. I was always looking at some body of water. And so what we have talked about in the book, I believe is indicative of this larger issue that when you start to think to yourself, if there is a body of water, let's say east of the Mississippi for sure, but also west, that we should be having an underground railroad or a maritime escape narrative associated with that space. And what Cassandra was talking about in terms of looking at William Still's work, a lot of what this book did was corroborate his stories, was to connect the dots. We had an escape story with Box Brown, for example, but we didn't understand that there was a shipping line that developed these canal boats that were going through the C&D canal. So all of these things sort of fell into place. It was almost like a giant puzzle came into perspective um, from the work that we all pulled together for this volume. What's the best guess as to how many people escaped? You know, we hate that question, just to let you know. Okay. <laughs> the reason why is because you're talking about a secret operation. Right. You're talking about the most successful people. You're never going to hear about them. If they didn't write a narrative, they're gone. So any number we give you, we would expect to be grossly underestimated. Slaveholders do not want this to look like it is a, the mammoth problem that it is. So there are a lot of reasons why the numbers are going to be deflated rather than inflated. That's all. Is there anything any of you would like to add to, to lend some sort of context uh, or color to the question of what this was like for people. Tim, by, by, uh, by escaping, was a person uh, endangering his or her family? Uh, it varied very much from case to case. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think I'd like to offer some commentary on just to follow up on a couple of the earlier questions. Yeah, of course. Um, to kind of contextualize this a little bit. Um, one of the reasons why the Maritime Underground Railroad is so important to understand is that it allowed a avenue of escape for people from the Deep South. The overwhelming majority of documented successful overland escapes all begin within just a few miles of a border with a free state. Very, very few people ever escaped any long distance over land because it was almost impossible to do so. Traveling through a, um, uh, a, uh, a, a hostile territory where there were patrols looking for escaped slaves, where you had to document your, uh, uh, your, your uh, license to travel, where you had to organize provisions, where you didn't know the way, overland escapes over long distances simply didn't happen very often. By contrast, someone escaping from the coast of the far south, Georgia, the Carolinas, uh, Virginia, could get on a ship, and as soon as they're three miles offshore, they're out of federal jurisdiction because the international waters were only three miles offshore. And once you were on board that ship, your main work was done, was, your main job was done. Uh, you could take a ride for several days, in some cases a bit longer, but you could be in a free port relatively easily with relatively little effort. That's why the Maritime Underground Railroad is so important. Um, with regard to evidence, 70% um, of all of the published uh, slave escape narratives mention maritime escapes as, a, um, uh, as, as their method of escaping. So there are about 120 slave narratives, about 70% of them uh, mention uh, maritime escapes. We have 200,000 extant American newspaper advertisements that are runaway slave advertisements, and a very large proportion of them uh, mentioned because the owners are publishing what they suspect was the method of the escape. And so in many cases, we have uh, owners, the owner class, recognizing that this is a absolute sieve of people leaving from Southern ports. And the final comment I would make about this is that it's the knowledge of waterfront work and the knowledge of maritime trades that gives strategic knowledge to the people who are escaping. This is mostly people who work along the waterfronts, who are watermen themselves, who are fishermen or ferrymen or working on lighters or working on vessels that are working in the coastwide wise trades. They understand how the maritime world works. And this gives them strategic knowledge so that they take their fate into their own hands and, um, and have agency for their escapes. They don't actually engage for most of them. They don't engage with the underground railroad networks until they get into the north. And so these are self-motivated people who are seeking freedom by leveraging their own maritime labor and their maritime understanding of how the world of the water works. Um, to come back then to your question about endangering families, uh, if one noted, uh, knowingly uh, helped someone to escape, for a black person in the South, that was usually a capital offense especially if you're a free black. Um, if you uh, are found to have assisted in the escape of what was in effect a very, very valuable piece of property, that could be a capital offense. If you're a white person, particularly a captain or a sailor coming from the, uh, the North, going down to the South, the risk that you took in helping someone to escape aboard your vessel was significant. You could have your vessel seized, which was your livelihood. You could be imprisoned. Um, it usually fell short of a capital offense for a white person, but nevertheless, uh, the, the penalties were very, very high. And so if that was a family person, then absolutely, uh, you were putting your family person in danger if they helped you. On the other hand, many people who escaped, we find that they either sent word back to try to get their family members out, or they actively tried to help people to escape to join them in the North. You know, if I can just add one more thing to that, John, we also see people who are escaping because the family is already in danger. Um, they either have already sold part of the wife or the husband, or there is the threat of sale for the person themselves or for their children so that there already is a destabilization of the family before some of these escapes occur.
So we have to understand that. the And there's also coercion because we see people who are being told, if you don't escape, then I won't sell your children. So there's, there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of complexity that goes on in the family dynamic around escape. It looks like, you know, here's somebody who abandoned their family. That's the way, you know, you want people want to interpret these things. But that is rarely the straightforward um, understanding of what's actually happening. And could I also add this, because you, you really, uh, both of you made some important points. Um, what I found with some of the uh, people who were conductors and with the maritime industry, you know, the conductor didn't actually take you all the way to the north. Uh, that person would connect you with a ship captain or ship or um you know, somehow secret you aboard that vessel or provide some sort of conveyance for you. And many of these individuals worked in taverns uh, that had a, that were always near the waterfront that had a lot of activity, uh, maritime activity going on with people staying in the tavern. We know that a woman by the name of Eliza Baines, who was uh, an enslaved woman in Portsmouth, she was a conductor uh, who helped a lot of people escape. Um, but you know, many of these individuals were also conveying information uh, through the network um, to enslaved people. Um, in Norfolk, for example, in the 1840s, the city council actually said that um, they were passing an ordinance saying that they would stop delivering newspapers to the enslaved population. And they were delivering abolitionist newspapers. And my mind just kind of exploded because I'm thinking, wait a minute, they had a subscription to a newspaper? They had a subscription to an abolitionist newspaper and they were delivering that to an enslaved person, which of course meant they were literate they had extra money and many of them did because they hired out their time. But the fact that the city actually allowed that, you know, that's why by the 1850s, so many cities and towns throughout the South were, were, were desperate trying to stop this flood of what they characterize as a flood of people leaving from the South. So they were looking at millions and millions of dollars of revenue every single year leaving the South. And then on top of that, um, if you got arrested, like William Bayless, who had a schooner uh, that went back and forth, he, he came out of Delaware, um, he was caught helping a number of people escape, and he was thrown in the Virginia penitentiary. And what they would do for a lot of, of whites who were thrown into the Virginia penitentiary is they give them a 10-year sentence. And that was equivalent to a death sentence because nobody survived 10 years in the penitentiary. Absolutely nobody. And fortunately, the war started, and that's what helped him to be able to secure, his family secured his uh, release early, but he, he had even been reported at one time having died after about two years in the penitentiary. And so those are some of the struggles and some of the issues and incidences that happen on a regular basis. And as you peel back the layers with some of these accounts, like the New Era published accounts uh, toward the end of the 19th century from people who were involved, especially if you were in Boston or if you were in somewhere in um, the Northern areas, they will publish accounts of what you were doing, you, these underground railroad activities. But you also had the Colored American magazine that published some accounts. That was a magazine that also was being published around that period. And when you start to connect those dots, you start to see this network that's huge and that is very deliberate and extremely good at being secretive. Cheryl, so, these comments actually point up another body of evidence that we use to prove that this is happening, and that is uh, municipal um, ordinances and state laws that are enacted specifically to stop people from leaving Southern ports to try to escape to freedom. So you have commissions set up to search vessels that are leaving uh, port before they clear the harbor. They are fumigated. They burn uh, sulfur and, and vinegar beneath, below the decks to try to drive out people who are uh, hidden beneath the decks. They do a number of things 
that um, uh, that that uh, they set up laws to try to stop this from happening, and they set up penalties. So by looking at that body of evidence, it's very very clear that this was a major problem. Yeah. It was a major economic drain on the South, and they did everything they could to try to stop it. But they couldn't afford to replace their entire labor force on the waterfront, which was almost universally enslaved people. And so they uh, made the decision that they were going to try to stop this activity, but they couldn't completely cut it off. It was impossible. So, and so they were thrilled, by the way, when they discovered people who were escaping. Norfolk newspaper published an article in 1855. The, the heading was, the Underground Railroad is Broken. And that's because they actually discovered some people trying to escape and they were thrilled. And that really suggested the level of desperation that was there in trying to stop this, this onslaught of people escaping from slavery. So, so one general point, Cheryl, that you get from reading the book is that, that the, the, the water passage was critical for almost any person escaping to freedom. So why has the maritime narrative fallen out? Why isn't that part of the narrative that somebody who's not an expert would know? You know, I think we will all give you a slightly different answer. I think that um, the major works that came out were, you know, Still and Seabird initially, and, and the ones that followed all focused on land-based routes. Um, when we think about someone like Tubman, who had water, but, you know, her, her biggest escape is on the water. But we don't, because of the way the Underground Railroad has been both remembered and under theorized. And this is a point I really wanted to, to make. The Underground Railroad has existed for um, several, for at least 200 years in a narrative of lore and stories and very little narrative of theory or in, in terms of how we've looked at this book, starting to come together and say to you, this is what they did but this is how they did it and this is why they did it. These are the laws so that we're beginning to codify this. So the, the maritime escapes, I believe, were more um, individualistic in terms of how they were handled. Yes, there are systems in place, but they're not the same systems as going over land where every 10 to 25 miles you have to, someone else picks you up. And I think the waterways escape, as everyone has pointed out, while you're on the water, you make your escape. But then when you get back on land, you're picked up again into the Underground Railroad, even before 1850 or after 1850, rather, when the whole country becomes fraught with danger, that after 1850, even if you escape by water and you land in New York or Massachusetts, you're still in danger. So the overland route has to pick up again to get you out of the country and into Canada, which then puts you back in the waterways and then back on land. So that's one answer. And I'm sure that Tim and Cassandra will, will give you others. Tim, what's your answer to why the maritime side of this has, has fallen out? So I would agree with, um, with uh, everything that Cheryl said, but I would also add that uh, in terms of American historiography, um, maritime history has sort of fallen out of fashion in the middle of the 20th century. And, and furthermore, we've sort of lost our connection as a people with the sea. If you look at the 19th century publications on the Underground Railroad, there were nods and acknowledgments that the maritime side was very important. Uh, Still and Seabird both mention it um, frequently. But in the 20th century, the writing about the Underground Railroad, because historians, generally speaking, don't have a maritime side to their research. They aren't trained to appreciate the importance of maritime endeavors and maritime industries to the American story, the, the US historical picture of the 19th century. Almost all trade uh, coastwise is carried, I mean, all of it's carried by, by, by vessels and you don't have a, a highway or a railroad system or bridges along the coast that allows for overland traffic very easily until quite late in the 19th century. And so of course this, uh, the easiest way to move people and cargo uh, to any of the major port cities along the East Coast is by water. But American historians, in the, especially in the second half of the 20th century, have lost a view of that or a, an appreciation for that. And so we're trying, to, um, we're trying to put that maritime picture back where it belongs, right in the front and center. 
because almost every escape from the far south, from the deep south, is achieved by water, and it's not achieved overland. Um, and this is therefore a really important uh, component of the Underground Railroad that needs to be uh, reinserted into the narrative. Cassandra, what would you add to that? Well, I, I agree with my colleagues wholeheartedly. I, I think also there's the iconic image that a lot of abolitionists were using showing uh, a man, you know, with a little stick, you know, like he's and he's running away. And, and that kind of cemented in our minds and then really became a major uh, part of how people viewed the Underground Railroad when they when when uh, Harriet Tubman uh, became this sort of represent representative figure uh, for uh, not only people who escaped, but also for conductors. And so everything was measured by her activities and everything was defined by her activities. And even the way that people envisioned a conductor was defined based on her. And, and that's not to take away her incredible work, um, but it I think it, it may, be, may point to why so many people have this image that's, that's really not a holistic image of, of the network, the incredible network that existed. And I, I call it a, a national network, but it, it had sort of an independence uh, locally. So because you would see people come and go. Uh, we had um, a man in uh, Hampton Roads, they, they, his nom de plume was Bluebeard. And he was, uh, um, when, his, when he escaped, um, he really didn't tell his wife. Um, and, and the reason was what happened to her afterwards. So when he escaped, um, the, the authorities took her for questioning and they beat her mercilessly. They tortured her, trying to get her to not only say where he went, how he went, but they knew that he was part of this network. And so they were trying to get information and she barely survived that particular beating. And you would read countless stories like Cheryl was talking about earlier of, you know, how, um, People who escaped, especially the, when the men escaped, they didn't tell their wives. They didn't tell their families because of this kind of fear. They knew that if they said something to them, that those family members would be questioned. But then once some of them escaped, they spent the rest of their time trying to bring those loved ones to, to wherever they were and were, were very passionate about trying to make sure that they were reunited with their loved ones. And in a few cases, they actually were in a lot of cases, they never were reunited or if they were, they had already started new families. But I would say that, you know, those of us who do this work, we have to work harder, we have to work longer, we have to dig deeper. The information is not there. It's not like we can come into Kluge Center and tell you this is what we're looking for and you're going to bring out a body of information for us to work with. It doesn't work like that. We are forever digging and sweeping together these crumbs of information to get this larger narrative. So I mean it just it, it's it's a it's an art it's a um, labor of love. I'm going to hit each of you with the hardest question at the end. We only have another minute or so. And that's, uh, I'll start with you, Tim. What's the one takeaway theme that you would want a person to get from your book? The one takeaway theme, I think, is that um, the majority of escapes from the far south happen by water, and very, very few uh, overland escapes, escapes happen from any distance uh, very far from a, a free state. So that the, the, um, the, the uh, overland uh, side is important, but the maritime side, which has been underappreciated, uh, is where we're really talking about escapes from the coastal areas of the Carolinas, Georgia, Virginia, and in many cases, Maryland. So it's extremely important. And it's, uh, it's, it's maybe half the story. Cheryl, what's your one thematic takeaway? You know, I think, that, first of all, that families, large groups can escape by water. That 
there is a level of pre-planning that people do not want to assign to anyone who's held in, in slavery. That, you know, when you escape over land, you know, there's this fellow or, or woman with a bundle and you you have this, under, this, given this image of this spontaneous eruption and that there's a problem and they leave, which is often not the case. But that pre-planning has to precede when you're getting out of slavery with large numbers of people. And so that the waterways provides not only an expedient way out of slavery, but an expedient way for large groups of people to come out of slavery. And that those escapes are often accompanied by fairly complicated or complex uh, escape plans, sometimes not, but that there is um, a level of anticipation, forethought, and planning that goes into these escapes. Cassandra? You get the last word. I would say that the Underground Railroad is not what you thought it was, not what you think it is. It is so very different, so very expansive, and there's so much more we can uncover as we move forward. And my hope is that people will begin to understand that the Underground Railroad is not about a series of myths and theories and whatnot, but it is a very complicated, very human story, and one that really should grip the imagination in terms of what people are willing to do to seek the one thing that sometimes we take for granted, and that is freedom. Well, on behalf of Literary Initiatives and the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress, we thank all three of you for a fascinating conversation about what I think is an, a very important book. And uh, we look forward to you uh, being a part of the library community in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.